Good morning and welcome to the Spigot and Forrester webinar, The State of Innovation in Banking and Insurance, The Disruption Has Begun. Um, we're pleased to be joined this morning and this afternoon for those in Europe by uh, Olivia Burdock, the Senior Analyst with Forrester. Um, first, a little bit of housekeeping on the webinar. The webinar is being recorded. Um, all attendees will receive a recording of the presentation via email as a follow-up. All attendees are on mute. We encourage um, participation during the course of the webcast by using the chat box to ask any questions. There will be a Q&A period towards the end, so all of your questions will get reviewed. And we were joined as well by Spigot's Director of Communications, Kiati Shah, who will be asking the questions. So first, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you Olivia Burdock, the Senior Analyst at Forrester. Olivia is a Senior Analyst serving European commercial consumer financial services sector. Sorry about that, Olivia. Let's sit <laughs> no <on. worries. laughs> um, We're very pleased to work with Olivia. She knows a tremendous amount about financial services and the digital disruption that's happening in it, and specifically her research focuses on digital transformation of banking, insurance, wealth management, mapping out digital strategies, adoption trends, and best practices. Um, Olivia helps clients understand how technology is changing consumers' expectations of financial services and what obstacles and opportunities this offers to businesses. Um, Olivia's presentation this morning is tremendous and I think um, everybody's going to learn a, a tremendous amount. A little bit of background about me. I am Amy Millard. I am the Chief Marketing Officer for Spigot. Um, I lead all strategic and operational aspects of marketing here at Spigot. Um, Spigot is uh, uh, crowdsourcing innovation software and, and we work closely with the financial services sector. So at this point, I'd like to hand over the slides and the presentation to Olivia. Great, thank you very, thank you very much, uh, Amy. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to present. Um, as Amy mentioned, uh, I am a senior analyst at Forrester Research, and my area of focus is digital disruption and digital innovation in retail financial services. So, what I wanted to talk to you today. Um, I wanted to share some of my research around digital innovation, the obstacles to innovation, and what best practices we have encountered as part of our research. I wanted to start off with a poll to understand a little better what obstacles you have faced when uh, trying to innovate. So if, um, if everything works well, we should be able to um, see a poll now. Uh, the poll is up. The question is, when it comes mm -hmm. to innovation, what is the big, biggest obstacle you face today? Select one of the following, culture, technology, resources, not a priority, and for the special few out there, no obstacles. <laughs> I think these answers are quite consistent with our research. We often find that culture and particularly in financial services technology are one of the biggest obstacles to become more innovative. So hopefully um, the presentation today will address some of these issues. Um, just to give you a bit of an uh, update on why I think it's so important for financial services firms to innovate. I think we can all agree that we have entered a, a new era and here at Forrester we call this the age of the customer. So I think a lot of people think that technology is the main driver behind digital disruption. And to a certain degree it is, but actually we think it's the customers and how they adopt and use this technology um, is what, what, what is driving that disruption in digital financial services. Customers who are able to access information about financial products from anywhere they want, uh, who are able 
to use the internet to get access to those products and also have now a lot more transparency about price and can compare different financial products um, from different providers. So we think it's the empowered customers that are driving digital disruption. And digital disruption uh, is something that we've seen over the last couple of years really affecting investment banking, payments, and insurance. So we've been building a, a, a database of these software-driven startups, digital disruptors as we call them, and we now see a whole range of clusters of disruptors affecting financial services firms, whether that's through mobile payments or small business funding or peer-to-peer -peer lending. There are all these different clusters where startups are hoping to take um, a chunk of the financial services uh, pie. And I'm not saying that all of them are equally important because we, we think that some are more viable as businesses than others. But I think there is definitely a, a feeling in the financial services firms that the competitive landscape is changing um, as a result of customers driving that digital disruption. And I wouldn't want to say that incumbents um, aren't responding. I think there is a, a story in the, in the market that lots of these small startups are trying to eat, eat um, financial services uh, lunch, but no one is responding. I don't think that's true. I think we're seeing a tremendous amount of activity in the market. and. Here I've, I've put all, this, all of these different logos of global financial services firms to show you how much activity there is in very disparate uh, fields like cryptocurrencies or robo-advice, one of the most popular um, area of, of investigation now, even things like video banking or how we enable remote account opening. There are also firms that are um, investing in crowdfunding or alternative finance, or firms that are even uh, th that have even decided to set up their separate digital or mobile bank. So, so there is a lot of activity in this space. Um, but you, you know, activity doesn't always mean that we are successful in launching some of these innovations, as you have indicated in our poll culture and technology do remain significant obstacles. One thing that we have seen uh, changing is that I think the CEOs and top management of banks and insurance and wealth management firms have really bought into the vision of digital disruption. So here I, I put a quote by Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan Chase, who, who does say that indeed there are hundreds of startups with a lot of brains and money working on various alternatives to traditional banking. So there is a recognition that times are different and maybe this time the disruption is real and it matters. And it's the same for insurance. Um, here we have Henri de Castri, the, the chairman and CEO of AXA, really also saying that if two people in, 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 a, in a garage can have a good idea and turn it into 1 billion customers after 10 years, why can't 100,000 talented people at AXA have more than just one good idea and be able to convert their ideas into reality. So all of these different um, CEOs have bought into the vision of digital disruption and are wondering how they can make their own companies to be equally disruptive because they do have lots of talented people and sometimes it's about the obstacles to innovation. Now, I think it's, it makes sense to think about what innovation really means, and particularly in the context of um, digital disruption and software-driven innovation. I think there is a danger of adopting this very technology-centric perspective. So I, I, I hear a lot of about the impact of blockchain or APIs or virtual assistance or artificial intelligence and, and what it all means for financial services. But I always think that 
technology should be seen as an enabler rather than a disruptive force in itself because it's what we do with that technology and how we translate it into new products or, or new services for customers um, that matters. So the definition that I like using is digital innovation being all about how we use digital technologies to systematically deliver new or improved services for customers. I, I genuinely think, and this is one commonality that has come across from all my research interviews over the last couple of years, is that innovation leaders often uh, use the customers to decide what ideas they should pursue because they're using the customers to, to help them um, determine what matters and what doesn't. So I think digital innovation should be very much uh, customer focused. And if you do face cultural or technology obstacles, I think that's okay because we can all recognize that becoming an innovator takes time and it won't happen overnight. To give you an example of someone that we see as an innovation leader, BBVA, we've been tracking their digital innovations in the last um, seven or year, eight years. And as you can see from this timeline here, one thing that uh, really marks them apart is the fact that every single year they, they release um, a few new products or, or services for customers. And that started back in 2008 where, where they were working on a, on a community, online community for customers. It included um, lots of iPad and iPhone apps when, when the iPhone came to the market and of course continues to this day with the introduction of wealth management services for, for the mass affluent customer segment uh, and this one with um, Future Advisor, so one of these startups. So BBVA is a very good example of a company that has been systematically innovative and keeps on rolling out new services for their customers. And of course, that kind of vision of having to continuously innovate um, could be potentially quite scary, right? Because you, you can never just relax and think, oof, I, I've done it now, it's a, it's a continuous journey. And I think it's common uh, to, to see innovation teams really having a lot on their plate. So here I've brought in a, uh, an example of an innovation team at, at a large bank. And this innovation team has 70 people who, whose, whose role is to scan the market for trends, to understand all the threats and opportunities, to really provide that level of coordination across the bank to make sure that they don't duplicate initiatives. Um, it's also about determining which the priority areas are and developing that innovation ecosystem where you find startups and entrepreneurs and, and businesses and you help them innovate and support them with funding and, and, and help you um, deliver innovation as well. There is also that element of culture that we've mentioned earlier, and a lot of innovation teams have tasks like making sure that they share best practices, that they train their colleagues on how to take an idea from from just an idea to 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 really a, a, a an existing product or service. It's also about um, tutoring entrepreneurs and uh, teaching others how to apply new innovation methodologies and even developing solutions through the experience um, or design lab. And if that's not enough, there's also that element of coordinating and managing the entire uh, innovation portfolio to make sure that you know exactly what projects you have in the pipeline and you know how they're developing and that you measure that innovation impact so you don't go just after all the shiny objects but are really pursuing ideas that are important to your firm and to, to its business objectives. So as you can see, that's, that's a lot of different areas of activities um, that can be quite overwhelming, I think. So in order to, to help um, innovation teams, I think it's useful to think about innovation uh, as a set of different stages from 
generating ideas, to evaluating those ideas, incubating some of the best ones, implementing them, and then, of course, measuring the impact. So I think these different stages um, have slightly different parts and slightly different team members potentially working through this. But I think the discipline is important because unless you know how your idea is progressing, you don't know potentially where you have a, a roadblock in your innovation pipeline and where you might have to tweak your process a little bit so you don't end up um, just maybe generating lots of ideas but never turning them uh, be into product propositions. I think one of the challenges that we see in the market is that it's considerably easier to generate um, interesting ideas but but it's quite difficult to decide in the face of limited resources which ones of these you should pursue or potentially um, how you incubate them so you don't end up just with a bunch of prototypes or proof of concept, but you want to, of course, turn them into something real, into an actual um, business proposition. So I think pushing the idea through that funnel and never casting something completely away, but maybe pausing some ideas and uh, prioritizing others is extremely important. And as we interviewed uh, um, some of the innovation leaders in the industry, we found that they all uh, have embraced a set of practices that help them manage each of these innovation stages. So whether that was opening the idea generation to make sure that they had lots of ideas coming from both within the bank or an insurance company as well as from outside. So, so things here that, that banks and insurance and wealth management firms are customer forums, um, crowdsourcing platforms, customer feedback forms, um, employee platforms, competitions, and these could be internal or external competitions, uh, inviting customers to the, their digital lab to, to share their ideas, hackathons, um, incubators or accelerators for startups, industry forums, or even just vendors and, and agencies uh, that you have existing relationships with. So once you have all, the, all these rich ideas coming from um, these varied sources, this is where you also need to employ a set of practices to help you decide which ones of these are really um, ripe to go further. So here you could be using things like employees or customers voting on what they think are the priority areas, or one of the most frequent um, structures that we see is the innovation committee and that could be made up of different heads of lines of business and maybe your technology colleagues or you know building an early quick proof of concept which doesn't cost a lot but could help you imagine how an idea could be implemented and then can help you explore the potential of a specific idea so once you have that narrowed down list of ideas this is where you move uh, to incubation and here we we think that that what works well are agile development methods where you keep on iterating the idea and, and building out different versions and you work uh, in short sprints um, starting with a minimum viable product and then making sure that you develop that product all the time and you bring in particularly in the bank it's very important that you bring on um, your colleagues from security and compliance and and uh, risk early on so they could help you evaluate any implications of your idea for, for them. Um, and testing beta versions and pilots with, with customers and employees is, uh, is another best practice. And once you have that, um, this is where you think about how to really operationalize that idea and implement it in a way that, that supports um, your colleagues and your own objectives because one other obstacle that we very frequently see is that um, teams are happy developing a proof of concept or a prototype and then just hand it over to someone else, whether that's their technology team or lines of business. And of course, very frequently we see that it is at this stage that innovation stops because those other people 
don't have that emotional investment in, in the idea or they just don't have the time to prioritize what perhaps to you has become a really, really very uh, important initiative. So I think it's it's very useful to think where you as a company are hitting a roadblock. Is it at any of these um, four stages of innovation and, and how you can get over that? So I wanted to share a few best practices. So I mentioned BBVA, which we see as a as a very much an innovation uh, leader in this space. So they use a, a set of different resources to help them across all of these different innovation stages. So they have an innovation team and innovation center. Um, that innovation center is in Madrid and another one in the US and another one in Colombia, um, where they test different ideas with customers and develop them further. Um, they involve employees from across the company in suggesting the ideas and voting on them as well. They have a venture fund that looks uh, for very um, interesting startups that could be another source of, of ideas of what they could be doing. They have a startup incubator um, and they work with, with different startups to, to really um, evaluate the potential of such ideas and then accelerate some of their development um, of those ideas. And the same role is played by a hackathon where they work with external developers using BBVA um, data, anonymized aggregated transaction data, to build solutions that are relevant to BBVA. And I think one uh, thing that has become clear from, from this discussion of BBVA is that the importance of open innovation. So traditionally, particularly in, in financial services, it was very common to protect your innovation, to have one research and development team that was working somewhere in an ivory tower protecting intellectual property and which was all concerned with, with, with being first um, to market to, to win customers. But I think we're moving away from that towards open innovation where ideas and testing of, of solutions is not just the prerogative of, of employees, but also of your customers with whom you can co-create and different external partners, whether those are established technology companies or startups, as I mentioned, um, or, or even just developers who are happy to get involved in, in a hackathon um, to try uh, in implementing a new app. So there is a risk to this approach. You, you obviously have a lot less control um, of ideas and which ideas get created. Um, you're less likely to have full ownership of, an, of your intellectual property. But I think the benefits of having a lot more ideas and being able to test them with a number of people clearly outweigh those uh, um, those risks. So you're really expanding um, your scope and the ability to, to bring um, additional ideas to beyond your employees. So to give you a few examples of that, Barclays Bank um, has one part of their mobile app which is fully devoted to gathering customer feedback. So if a customer, whilst using um, the mobile banking app, notices something missing or something wrong or would like some new features, they can immediately put those ideas here uh, and they will be sent to, to Barclays. Importantly, I think Barclays um, actually shows customers that it listens to those ideas. And I think that's great because it motivates someone to submit their ideas if they know that actually those ideas are being used for something. So Barclays has this Twitter campaign called You Said We Did, where it shares the, 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 the originators of certain ideas and how they've implemented um, them which is which is great because it exactly shows the fact that um, they actually listen and it motivates people to submit more ideas. Coming back to BBVA, uh, BBVA yes also includes customers um, in, in in the testing of of some of their innovations, but I think BBVA is remarkable in the sense that it's built a whole innovation ecosystem over the last seven years, which now has 
lots of startups, some of them uh, they've acquired, some of them like Duola or On Deck, they have partnered with to deliver innovation faster. They have this open talent um, competition, global competition to find great new businesses. They involve the external developers through their Innova Challenge. And they, of course, have partnerships with leading innovation institutes um, and companies like MIT and IDEO. Um, and they, they also have something called beta testers where anyone can just log in and test their solutions um, online. So it's a really a very, very large innovation ecosystem. Of course, there are there is also the role of um, digital labs. So digital labs have been launched by a number of banks and insurance companies um, and wealth management firms to really ideate and, and prototype and test new products. And I think this is great in the sense that it, it creates that joint space where you can really devote your full attention to innovation and you have faster processes and you have dedicated resources to make sure that you work on those new products and the best labs attract um, digital talent as well because people want to work in collaborative, colorful, dynamic spaces and particularly in digital innovation, there is a lot of competition for digital talent. There is one danger that I should mention, and that is if you create this ivory tower that is completely separated from the rest of the company, then you, you risk um, just ending up again with, with a bunch of prototypes that no one in the rest of the organization wants to take on because they haven't been involved in the building or prioritizing some of these ideas. So to make this uh, a success, you do need to host uh, teams from, from your organization in the labs, involve people in which ideas are chosen to, to be implemented, involve them in the prototyping to make sure that anything that you've built it actually reflects those business objectives and, and priorities of your colleagues and the same for your technology management colleagues that you don't build something in isolation that uh, you then sort of dump on your um, on your technology colleagues to maintain so that is one caveat that I would say um, you should consider when, when you're thinking about launching digital labs I think what's become clear um, throughout our research and, and hopefully through this presentation is that Agility um, really requires a, a slightly different innovation process, whereas in the past we had this R&D department that was working somewhere in an ivory tower and, and would uh, explore ideas and sometimes even build something. Now we have a much more uh, collaborative process where a number of people get involved in generating ideas, lots of people get involved in selecting the right uh, ones, particularly in, in the face of uh, limited resources. The fact that you need to involve your, your legal and compliance colleagues early on to see what of that is actually feasible, particularly in financial services uh, which are heavily regulated. And this is where you also start working in a very iterative manner where you think through the solution and you co-create with customers and you think through all the processes that will be affected as a result and, and how you integrate this. Um, and you iterate based on that and don't just hand over the, the finished product, but integrate it continuously uh, so that you can keep on innovating that product rather than just handing it over and, 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 and seizing any, any innovation. So this kind of innovation process is, is different and it requires also a slightly different um, set of people in, in your team. Someone uh, who will be the product owner and that person typically should be coming from business. There should be someone like a lending expert or an underwriting expert. You'd want someone who is a designer to make sure that the design doesn't get in, in a way of meeting user goals. You'd want a developer, uh, user experience expert, perhaps a business analyst or, or a back-end developer, someone from testing, 
compliance, legal, marketing, call center, you really have to think through whom the, your initiative is going to affect and, and how you bring them on early to discuss all the requirements and, and discuss you know, how the process will be managed from the beginning until, until it's rolled out. So I think this process is very, very important. Another um, element that has come across from our research is how do you balance your innovation portfolio, right? So I think it's easy to really get uh, very focused on incremental change because these are usually ongoing uh, priorities. They are financed from your standard budget and your their, your day-to-day -day job. So it's easy to keep on uh, just focusing on those and not thinking more about the one or two year uh, initiatives or, or even more radical um, disruptive innovations that have a three to five year horizon. So it's the sustained innovation that often um, is a problem because it's, it's not funded from an ongoing budget. It usually needs a dedicated pool of money that you can use to maybe prototype and, and test some of these ideas. And it needs that innovation process that I've just described to, um, to enable the idea to really become a, a fully fledged product. And of course, there is also the radical change. We shouldn't um, discount these ideas, even though they're a lot more risky and uh, and often uh, disruptive to, to both your business and the wider competitive landscape. One thing that we have heard um, from our interviewees is that it's important to really accept and embrace the fact that about 40 to 60 percent of all of these ideas um, will fail. So. Failing fast um, and failing cheap is one of those mantras. It's very difficult to implement. And I know particularly in financial services, the process that is involved means that it's almost never cheap to fail. And it's always risky for the careers of involved individuals. So that's why you often need to almost mandate a certain level of failure so that everyone accepts it as, as a result. And that's where we get into uh, the idea of slowly changing the culture and what is acceptable um, in terms of risk, risk that is not um, big systematic risk, uh, you know, like financial risk, but perhaps risk of um, failing one digital update, which is very, very different from, from a financial risk, I would say. So to, to recap, um, there are a few recommendations that I would make if you're uh, either at the beginning of this journey or maybe further down the line. I would say that you want to focus on things that are very much customer focused, so which are going to make um, your customers' lives easier, which are going to develop new value or um, focus on unmet customer needs. You want to have a balanced innovation portfolio, some incremental um, innovations, some more sustainable ones, and also disruptive innovations. And it's up to you how you balance and which ones you prioritize, but you want to have a balance. You should think of your innovation uh, pipeline in terms of the four stages I've described, generating ideas, prioritizing them, incuba incubating and implementing them so that you can find out whether you have any blockages at any of these stages and that are, therefore can target these with specific measures. You'd also want to open up your innovation process um, to gather more ideas faster and to test them and with as many people as possible. And that brings me to the idea of cross-functional teams. If you are going to work on digital innovation in particular, you are very likely to need the help of uh, colleagues in, in different departments, whether that's marketing or technology or, um, or perhaps business lines or even legal compliance um, and risk. That's because unless you, you have the support of these colleagues, it's very, very difficult to create an innovative culture where everyone feels empowered and incentivized to be innovative rather than just focus on their day-to-day -day jobs um, on an everyday basis. So these are my five recommendations. And I, I'm sure that Amy has also great examples um, of customers of, of Spigot who, who have implemented some of these and have other lessons um, that you can learn from based on their innovation journey. 
So thank you. Um, I, I will pass over to Amy now. Thank you, Olivia. That was really um, uh, interesting. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what we see in financial services from the Spigot perspective. For those who are not familiar with uh, Spigot, we are a software company. We are the have the number one market share uh, globally in innovation management. Um, we're extremely proud to have driven top line growth in our customers of over a billion dollars, and so far to date, over 200 patents have been applied for. Um, how this is relevant is that we help our customers find the best ideas, incubate them, move them forward from their employees, their customers and partners to build a culture of innovation. So we have a tremendous amount of experience in thinking about innovation in banking and insurance and understanding the challenges specifically that uh, companies have. We're proud to work with two of the three largest banks in the US, uh, large banks globally, life insurers, property and casualty insurers, um, including um, some large trading platforms as well. We're also proud to support the global Fortune 500 um, across, across the globe in their innovation processes. I wanted to talk a little bit about what the kinds of disruptions we see that are happening specifically in banking and insurance. Um, we see with our customers the rise of, in banking, um, financial tech companies um, the investment in fintech in the last year alone has quadrupled. Spigot is based here in Silicon Valley. We see, um, to uh, Olivia's point earlier, um, Silicon Valley is uh, coming for banking's bread and butter. Um, and our customers are working to address that, um, including um, JP Morgan, where Chase we're proud to have as a customer. Um, in, in addition, we see not just the uh, fintech uh, companies, but also new forms of banking, peer-to-peer -peer lending, um, uh, cryptocurrencies, the same uh, trends that Olivia was talking about, our customers are seeing as well. And those are banking trends we also see in insurance um, and property and casualty, that technology is having a tremendous impact on models that have been traditionally somewhat um, stable. Um, in the last few years alone, the rise of, um, of automated technologies in cars has uh, reduced the number of accidents. KPMG is predicting an 80% reduction in auto accidents and a 60% shrinkage in auto insurance premiums by 2040. Um, that's coupled with those that are property insurers with um, coverage and premium models being um, disrupted with the climate change across the globe that's changing the impact of severe weather. Um, and there are new kinds of asset models uh, here in the US, the leasing of rooftop solar changes how properties are insured. Um, the rise of the sharing economy has meant um, new models of insurance um, uh, for homeowners. So all of these are combining to create uh, a need for innovation on the part of, of our customers. So what is it that our customers are doing? Well, to back up a little bit, enterprise crowdsourcing for innovation is about engaging a lot of people who know your business best. That's your employees, your partners, your customers, to build a culture of innovation and drive business transformation. That's to break down silos, to maximize the entire wisdom of your employee base, to reach into those people who know you best, including your customers and partners. And the purpose of this is to improve the customer experience, to reach new customers, new markets, and build loyalty, to invent new products. It is not always about how can we improve the claims process, it is about how can we create entire new markets for our bank, for our property and casualty insurer. Um, 
In addition, there are opportunities for radical improvement in business processes. It is not just the financial tech companies who can create uh, new models um, of, of insurance, new models of banking. And a benefit to creating a culture of innovation is engaging and inspiring employees. Um, there are numbers of studies that show that engaged employees are more loyal, are more innovative, um, and it creates a, a virtual cycle. The reason that we are so excited about what we do is that it has a tremendous impact on our customers. Um, there was a recent report created by uh, another large research firm that showed that crowdsourcing and innovation management are the number one capabilities for CIOs that yield return on enterprise digital performance. Um, this year alone, the number one and number two recommendations from Gartner for CIOs are to implement crowdsourcing and innovation management. Um, even today, over 35% of global insurers, according to KPMG, already have an internal innovation program that is using crowdsourcing software like Spigot. Over 65% of financial services organizations in the US already have an innovation program in place. If you're not already thinking about how to implement technology for innovation, this is the year to begin thinking. Um, a way to think of it is, um, and I like um, uh, MetLife's approach to this, is if you think about one small financial tech firm with 13 employees um, and going up against all 70,000 of, of MetLife's employees across 50 geographical markets, um, they are thinking of their innovation process as not just addressing the rise of these competitors, but building competitive advantage for another 150 years. Um, all of the collective wisdom of the employees, customers, or partners of MetLife are being used to create new markets and new products for MetLife. So what are the specific kinds of problems that banks and insurers are, are addressing today to think about disruption? Um, here are some actual challenge questions from financial services that we've seen. Um, going into their employee base and thinking about how can we improve our customer experience? How can specific divisions and departments stay ahead of the curve on digital transformation? What new asset types, we talked about that, should we build a market around? For example, solar panels, should, um, should my insurance company think of a new asset model or a new monetization model? Um, how do we build an innovation first culture? How do we move that into our insurance agents? Those uh, agents are incredibly important for property and casualty. How do we take our company's insurance culture and move it out to the agents? And asking, the employees, who is our next disruptive entrant, and how do we outcompete them? For 100,000 employees, 50,000 employees, it's, it's amazing the innovations that we've seen come out of them. A specific example is our customer, Citibank. Um, there was a challenge from the CEO to build the next billion dollar idea, the next billion dollar business for Citi. And the CEO went to 263,000 employees in 97 countries um, and over 11 languages. And from these 97 countries, over 2,000 ideas for the next billion dollar business. Um, not only was it one of the largest campaigns that I've ever implemented, the CEO after that asked a great question. How, what is the value of these 2,000 ideas? If the best idea is over a billion dollars, the second best idea, is that also a billion dollars? How much value is, is, is held in my employee base of new markets, new ideas, and customer loyalty? Um, this is an example of tapping into not just your employees in the US, but across the globe for your innovation process. So I'm going to turn it over at this point to uh, to the people on the line to ask questions. So I'm, as a reminder, use the window in your um, GoToWebinar to uh, pose questions. 
that um, Kiati will ask of Olivia and myself. And as a follow-up, if you have any questions that aren't answered here, we'll be sure to follow up. And um, the Twitter handles of Olivia and myself are up here as well. So Kiati, what's the yes. first question? Well, there's certainly quite a few coming through, so, <laughs> so just bear with me. Um, first question was about the, the one of the slides that was presented that showed all the different disruptions that are taking place, digital disruptions that are taking place within the financial industry. Can one of you talk about what is the best approach for a company to jumpstart its innovation process? Olivia, I think that's a great question for you. To, to jumpstart your innovation process, what is the best approach? I think um, I would always say that uh, it's it's easy to to go after all the shiny things and get always uh, really obsessed by these fintech companies, and there are so many of them coming to the market. But I think it's important to to try to understand which ones of them are just smoke and mirrors and which ones actually offer some genuine advantage. So it's almost like applying, I think, a filter to these companies and asking yourself, are, are these companies doing something that genuinely meets uh, unmet customer need? Does it create new customer value? Does it attack a certain inbuilt inefficiency? And once you've answered that question, you want to answer also, is this an opportunity for me? Because the fact that maybe they're, they're doing that, that, that might um, be a good opportunity for someone else. But does this fit into your business strategy? Would, if, if you did something similar, would it all um, help you create a better customer experience or gain some operational efficiency or, or perhaps even um, attack new customer segments or, or build new new markets, as, as Amy said. So it's, it's very important, I think, to, to prioritize according to that. And, and once you have that list of prioritized ideas, uh, start asking yourself, do we build this ourselves? Do we partner with someone? How would this look like in practice? And then enter that into the, the innovation funnel that I talked about earlier. You know, get your employees to contribute ideas of how something similar could look like at your company. Great. Thank you for that, Olivia. Um, we have a question coming in. I'm asking about how would you align your innovation initiatives to your general business goals? One of you like to address that? Um, I would say, and I'll hand it over to Olivia, is that this is a, the most fundamental question of of an uh, innovation team. Um, technology, and we are a technology company, can't help you for your innovation team if the processes and your goals aren't aligned to the company strategy. So, so often it's the first question we ask. Uh, even as a software company, is what are the, your number one through five goals as a company? Because if you're building out your innovation processes and they're not aligned to what the company cares most about, the innovation team won't be nearly as successful in catching the eyes of the employees because the employees are engaged in with the key initiatives of the company. They don't want to work on small things. They want to work on big things. And aligning into the overall strategy of the company actually does a fantastic uh, job to helping build with the culture of innovation. Olivia, your perspective? Uh, yes, I, I agree entirely. I think that uh, particularly around technology, it's, it's so easy to get drawn into um, the, these buzzwords um, that don't necessarily mean anything for you um, or, or will just simply distract you or, or waste some resources. Um, I think we, we always tell our clients that you shouldn't be building a, a digital strategy or you know just a, a bunch of digital solutions. You should be digitizing your business strategy. So you should be thinking about how technology is going to help you meet some of these objectives that you know your your CEO or or, or maybe your your top management has has put down and and. Also, obviously, don't uh, don't underestimate the ideas coming from your employees. Some of the best ideas we've seen around, particularly the improvement of customer experience, come from someone like the, the like your call center staff that deal with complaints 
with customers every day and have perhaps uh, the best insight into what's bothering your customers and, and maybe how, how you could fix that. So I think both a mixture of, sort of top-down business strategy driving you as well as some incremental improvement and focus on real customer problem is, is, are the filters that you want to apply. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, we just have a few more minutes to go, so I'm going to run through uh, the next two set of questions that we have received. Um, the one question is about open innovation. We uh, are wondering where we can find out more about open innovation. We've seen this concept mentioned elsewhere, but we're looking for structural examples that describe a working ecosystem and value chain. Are there some resources that Amy and Olivia that you would like to recommend? Well, I'll make a plug for Olivia here. Um, she's written a number of reports on digital disruption in banking. Um, if you won't make the plug yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Forrester has written a lot of reports, uh, including a, a number of reports specifically about open innovation and, and how you start and all the pros and cons that you, you have to keep keep in mind. Um, but uh, so, yes, yeah, thank you, Amy, to, to pointing, uh, for pointing out to, to my reports. I think my reports mention open innovation quite a lot because I do think that um, crowdsourcing and open innovation are definitely key to success. And um, for specific examples of how open innovation works in financial services, um, it's Spigot, we're happy to um, to have in-depth uh, conversations with anybody who's interested. It is it is our our core business is understanding how to support the security systems of of banks and insurers while enabling um, hundreds of thousands of people to contribute. So it's 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 something we do all day, every day, and we're very passionate about. Any more questions, Kiani? Yes, we will have one last question. Um, now, the BBVA, BBVA example um, showed some great success with an innovation team they have in place. If our company does not have an innovation team, which team would you recommend run this type of crowdsourcing innovation program? Should it be the engineering group or another team? Your thoughts on this? Yes, I, I presume that's a question for me, so I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll take it. Um, I, I, I don't think it, you need an innovation team specifically to, to make this happen. I've seen um, basically whichever team is most passionate about this um, take lead. So I have seen companies where it could come out of something like customer experience group, if you have a customer experience uh, group, because someone let's say like ING actually puts most of their innovation efforts um, into their customer experience center because they want all the innovation to be very much focused on the customer and finding new solutions and improvements for the customer. I have seen a few uh, banks or insurers as well uh, which have their innovation coming from the from the IT team or from technology management uh, and that's possible as well. Um, what is important I think is particularly if it is on the on the IT side you, you don't want to as I mentioned earlier, be very, very technology centric. Um, you want to make sure that you see technology as an enabler, but if you do have someone driving innovation from the IT side, then you have to find very good partners and sponsors in the in lines of business because you, you need to find some solutions that will help them address their issues. Um, just as they need to come to, to IT um, to find out if there are any great emerging technologies um, that could help them resolve some of those uh, problems that they're facing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Olivia. And with that, we conclude our webinar today. Uh, a follow-up email will include both the slides as well as the recording of this webinar. So thank you, everyone, for your time this morning. Amy and Olivia, any parting thoughts? Um, Thank you for the questions. We're going to follow up with everybody if we did not get to them. And thank you so much, Olivia. I thought the presentation was fantastic. No, thank you so much for, for having me here and giving me an opportunity.
Um, it's been great. I think innovation will definitely stay on top of everyone's minds. Um, so if you need to, uh, um, if you have any questions. Great. And that concludes this webinar. Thank you.